we're going to cover uh, the second chapter of the introduction to statistical learning book. Uh, we delve a little bit more into supervised and unsupervised, first, only supervised learning. And uh, now get, getting a look at a couple of models and how do, we, how do we actually compare them to get an idea of which is better than one at predicting or classifying data. So I'll be using my notes for most of the, of the part, but I want to take a look at the notes of the previous cohort. When, go, when we go to the last section uh, for, the, for the part of, of predicting to which category uh, some observation belongs to. Okay, so let's start. Uh, as I said, this is chapter two. Uh, so we will begin with what is a statistical learning? Uh, we will deal with developing models to predict some value. So for the most part, we'll be, we'll be referring to some numeric value that we want to predict. Uh, about the notation, we will be using this x1 up to x sub p. They are the features or the predictors that we're going to use in our model. And the output variable, that is what we want to predict, we will simply label it as y. And it, it, will, it will also be mentioned as the response or the dependent variable. So to create the model, of course, we assume first that there is some relationship between the variables that we are considering, that is the, the response and the predictors. We are going to simply label X as the set of predictors, the set of P features. And now we have to take into, into account also the fact that uh, the, the, the real life data gather, that, that is the observation that we have such that uh, we have such uh, values inscribed into this x1 up to xp values. Uh, this actually come with some error terms, and we basically are going to describe uh, this error or this well, yeah, this error term as epsilon. We are assume, we are assuming that it is independent from x from the features that we are considering. Uh, that it has mean zero. Uh, and in that sense, uh, this function f is going to represent the information that x provides about y. But simply to take note in the fact that uh, independent of how, man, how much data we, we gather, there's going to be some error term. So even from the start, our prediction, our estimations, uh, they will never be perfect. I think only the counterexample is of that of that is when you actually do get to 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 retrieve data that covers the entire population, but probably in, in such cases is that that can be done because the population is really not that big, or, or there is a way to actually gather all, all of that data, but that's not the common case. So let me, let me take a look at this picture and. Let's see. Ah, yes, yeah, so this is the idea, right? In this case, we're comparing the income and years of education. Uh, and what we were mentioning as error terms, this epsilon amount, uh, basically this uh, distance that is between these red points, that is the observed values, what we are labeling as X, and, and the actual relationship like a theoretical one between the variables X and the output variable Y. And in that case, that theoretical relationship is this blue line. So even the observed values differ by the, by the, by the, by the theoretical relationship due to these shifts of the red points of the observations caused by the error term. So what we will be covering today, uh, well, on also through the whole book, is different approaches to estimate F, different approaches to, to synthesize the, in the relationship within the information that we have, that is the input variables, and, uh, and what we want to predict, that is the output variable. So 
there were there is two main reasons why we would want to perform this estimation and that is one of them is prediction the other one is inference but i will start with prediction uh, as i mentioned at the beginning we are going to predict some some feature y using some set of inputs some data some data that we have gathered x uh, and from f which in this case was this blue line, this theoretical relationship, we're going to make an estimation. And such estimate is going to be labeled as F with this hat. I, I don't remember, I don't remember how this said. I'll call it F hat. So this will be our F estimate, F hat, from which we will use the data X, the inputs, to perform this prediction, Y hat. So the estimate F hat uh, takes in the data the inputs and perform this prediction. It will be our estimate for, for Y. So in this case, our prediction, uh, because we mostly care, we mostly care about the numeric value, or sorry, the predicted value. Uh, it, it is mentioned in the book that this estimate F hat is kind of treated like a black box because we don't, we don't really understand its form or its shape. In the sense that, for example, for this blue line, uh, well, in, if it were the, the actual estimate, uh, we don't really know like what is the, the function that describes such line. For example, if, we, if it were a, for a cubic polynomial, we don't know the coefficients that define such cubic polynomial. That is what, what we, in this case, mean for uh, labeling the estimate as a black box. We don't really know. Uh, the exact form of the estimate. However, if it is getting, if it, if such estimate is producing accurate prediction for the variable y, then uh, at least in this case, uh, it's good enough. Now, but how do we know uh, that an, a prediction is accurate or not? Well, that depends in a couple of facts. First, in a reducible error, that is a, an error that happens due to our estimate f hat not being a, a perfect copy or like a complete description of what the true relationship is, the relationship between the input and the output. And this, this error is uh, labeled as, redu as reducible because we actually can make it very small or perhaps very big but, but we have control over it uh, via which statistical learning technique we're going to use with our data. Uh, and now to the other source of error for the predicted values accuracy, that is the irreducible error. This is due to this error term that I mentioned. And uh, this error term sometimes can be like, for example, uh, which, which variables you're not considering in your model. For example, in this case, we're only accounting for P variables, but it also may be some, uh, sorry, epsilon may be also some information that uh, we simply can't access. So, and there, there was this example in the book uh, about an error for predicting, I think like, uh, uh, the chance of a patient of having some sickness, uh, basically, um, what they were what they were mentioning as some unknown some unknown information that, that is uh, contained into this epsilon variable. Uh, they meant, for example, if for such patient, if there was some dependence, uh, if the medicine that he was taking, uh, like in the production process, if there was some error in such process because if there was or there wasn't we really wouldn't be able to tell so it's really something unknown that may have contributed over the output but we have no no way of knowing that information okay so there is a question the reducible error map onto the concept of bias that we visit and I think not because they, they actually got separated into three parts. And the part of reducible error 
like it's in other term not in the in the term for the epsilon amount so i, I will i will uh, consider consider again the question once we get there but at least now i think they are not related okay so as i was mentioning uh, we have this irreducible error due to epsilon and its variability um yeah because epsilon doesn't depend on x and uh, really it doesn't matter how we estimate f that is the, re the relationship the relationship within the inputs and the output uh, we can change this error we can reduce it and this is what i mentioned a couple of months ago maybe we didn't account for some variables in our model or perhaps there there is some information that we simply can't access uh, now uh, in the book that mentioned that if you were to take the expectancy of the of the real values uh, oh, sorry of the actual output that is why um, the expectancy of the square root of this difference that is the real value of y and the predicted value of y then we are simply this definition right what we have over here okay, this expression and then this can this can get uh, what do you say re-expressed as the following i think over here there is we are lacking a, a e term i think it's really the expectancy of this uh, let me double check Yeah, I really wouldn't quite make sense that the expectancy sign it disappears. I know it does. Okay, I don't know why. Um, uh, okay, but what, what, what I was saying is that uh, this discrepancy into, um, sorry, this discrepancy of the real values and the predicted ones uh, actually can be reduced to the reducible error that is the difference uh, between f and its estimator and the irreducible, irreducible error that accounts for these kind of uh, unknown variables or some randomness related to the problem. So really we can control, we can't control this irreducible error. So what we later on focus on is how to make this expression uh, really, really small. That is how to make our model more accurate. Now, this is one. This one. This was uh, one reason why we why we would want to estimate f. That was the prediction case, but also there is an inference inference scenario, and uh, in that case, uh, we are mostly interested in understanding the association between y and the features. For example, we could make such, such questions like which predictors are most associated with the response. So that is uh, whether which of them uh, have a bigger impact in the actual value of y. Also, what is the relationship between the response and each predictor? And that can be, for example, what is the shape of f of this relationship? And again, related to that question, is such relationship like a complex one, or maybe it can be summarized via some simple simple line. Uh, in those cases, well, we can take the black box approach because now we need this this understanding. So the exact form of our estimate is required. Uh, for example, in this in those sort of cases, uh, what we will change is which sort of model, uh, that is, which which sort of statistical learning technique we we will have to use, and it, it will be mainly those that allows us to have a greater inter interpretability of how the inputs are affecting the output, and some of them are, are for example, uh, nonlinear models, so. 
as we saw, or maybe we haven't seen it right now, but the, uh, as a simple case would be a simple linear regression that, that it just sticking a line to see if it kind of accounts for, for the data. Now, uh, those are some of the reasons why we would want to estimate F, such a relationship. But now, how do we actually do it? Um, in, the, in this later part, it, it's not like uh, the book becomes uh, more mathematical, but, but at least some, uh, some notation has to be introduced. For example, for the number of, of observations, that would be like the number of rows in a, in a data table, sorry, in, in, a, in a data frame, which accounts for the information that we have, the Y and the inputs. Then we label N as a number of, of rows in that, in that data frame. Uh, we also label X and Y, J as the value of the gate predictor for the white observation. So like the entry in the row Y and column J of our data frame. And also we label Y sub Y, now Y sub I as the response variable for the white observation. So that's simply in the white row, what, what is the value in the column that we want to predict? And we also define this very important term that is a training data. Well, this will be our set of observations. We are going to use it to estimate F. Um, what is actually the elements of this training data? Well, at least mathematic, mathematically, it would be uh, this set that it's really uh, like the whole data frame that we were considering earlier. Uh, now, our goal is to find a function f hat uh, such that uh, the actual values seen, that is the, the real values in, uh, the real values, uh, they are kind of similar to the predicted ones. But we want that to happen not only for the data that we are initially considering, that is our training data, our initial data frame, but for any observation related to this problem. So of course we're generalizing to cover more data, more, more cases. Um, and now to perform this estimation of F, of this relationship, uh, well, I think there are not only these two categories, but at least we are going to cover these two uh, a little bit in this in the chapter. And the first one is parametric. So in this case, we start by making an assumption, an assumption of the form of Y. In, in this case that we had early on, it would be something like, if we look only at the picture on the left, our assumption of the form of F could be something like, oh, perhaps I stick a, a, a line over here. Like we assume that, uh, that the relationship is linear. And then the, uh, well, and if it, in the case that it were linear, then we would represent it like this. Uh, and of course the parameters uh, uh, related to this parametric form uh, would be these coefficients, uh, beta sub zero up to beta sub p. Those are the parameters that we would want to estimate. Um, and now the second step is we have chosen our model. That is, we have made an assumption of the form of F. So we now need a, a procedure, a, a way to fit the model using a training data. And that is a way to, to generalize uh, this function so that it does not only account for the data that we have right now, but that it can actually predict the value that we want if we give it new data, that while later on the chapter describes as uh, testing data. Um, and the most common way to perform this fit uh, will be via this thing called ordinary least squares. Let's see, it tells me to check out this picture. Uh, yeah, because it's really like this expression, this expression over here. I mean, it's a linear, but because we are working with a high dimensional case, 
and it, it really doesn't have to be a line. It's it's really just um uh what do you say passive thing in English? Like a, a translation of a subspace of R N. So in this case, it's simply a plane, for example, a kind of general generalized linear model. They're using this plane to to model these points in in red. And so now, via this method, the parametric method, and the problem of estimating f has been reduced to a problem of estimating a set of parameters. So, for example, in the linear regression case, we only need to estimate p plus one values, these beta coefficients. Uh, of course, we could we can make our model more flexible, that is accounting for <clears throat> more and more complex forms, for, sorry, more and more complex possible forms of this f function that we want to discover. Uh, but if we do that, if we make our model more flexible, uh, this can lead to overfitting the data. And that happens, uh, and that means that if we try to follow too closely uh, these, these errors over here, for example, what over here is being labeled as these black lines, these errors, then we're accounting for some of the, of the randomness that came from this epsilon term. Uh, and we, re we really don't want that. It's because if we do that, then when we try to use our model now for other sets of data, that is to generalize our predictions, that it, it won't really match because we, we fit it too much, our model, to, to this noise, to these discrepancies, these black lines. Uh, now, that was one method for estimating F. And the second method that they describe it's non-parametric methods. And uh, well, these are these are more flexible in the sense that the, there are no assumptions being made about the form of the f function. Instead, really, uh, we want to make an estimate for that function. It's which get us really close to the data, to the data, to the data points as possible. Uh, of course, because we are not making assumptions about its form, we have a, a greater range to, to cover the, the, its possibilities. For example, if we were, um, no, perhaps I, I mentioned it later on. Uh, uh, and then uh, perhaps a, a disadvantage that comes with this non-parametric method is that it typically requires requires a, a bigger number of sorry a greater number of observations uh, compared to if you were to use a parametric approach, uh, and that is to to get an accurate estimate of f. And let's see this example. Uh, in this case, they are using a non-parametric approach to describe this data, these points in red. Uh, it, now this approach is called a smooth, simply the spline fit, uh, and we get this surface. And, and what, is, what it is trying to describe, that is, what is the actual F for this example? It is uh, this over here, this one. So it's really quite similar. And the flexibility allowed us to, con to account for more complexity of this surface in blue. And so, so now comes a point that, no, no, wait, uh, before, before moving on, before moving on uh, are there any questions or, or comments? Uh, okay, seems like not, so I will keep along. Uh, now, in this section, uh, we're going to discuss uh, a problem, uh, a sort of trade-off that arises in really independent of uh, which kind of method we use to estimate them. Uh, that is, if we use a parametric or a non-parametric one. Uh, and that will be the, the trade-off between the accuracy of our predictions 
uh, and how much we can interpret or interpret a uh, such model. So, so that's estimation of F. Uh, for example, we saw that parametrics models are usually pretty restrictive. For example, the, the linear regression name and the non-parametric models, they are quite flexible. Uh, for example, the, surf, the surface that we saw over here, this one. Uh, so now it turns out that uh, restrictive models uh, are usually more interpretable. So they are useful for inference, for understanding the association between inputs and output. Uh, and flexible models, well, they can be a little bit more difficult to interpret uh, due to the complexity of, of our estimations. For example, due to the complexity of how do we describe this, uh, this surface in yellow? It's not that easy as the other case, the restrictive case over here, because it's just a plane. So it's really only three parameters, three numbers. Okay, so now uh, we don't really delve a, a, a lot into unsupervised learning, but we will do that, that uh, in, the, in the last part of this chapter. So it will be mostly supervised learning. Uh, this we already mentioned in the first meeting. That is, uh, when we are consider, sorry, in the context of supervised learning, uh, we wish to predict or classify something, some output, uh, and we do that via some model that takes is that takes in inputs. So you have your inputs, your predictors, and your output that you want to predict. But now, in the case of unsuper unsupervised learning. Uh, will lack something to predict. It really is more about understanding the relationship between the variables or, or between the observations. Uh, however, uh, th there are occasions where one has to use like a combination of these two kinds of methods, but it is mentioned that we will not see that uh, sort of tool in this book at least. So now, we, we delve a little bit more into what is supervised learning and predicting something. So we will make a distinction between what is that that we want to predict? Is it a number or not? Uh, I will remember that response is what we are also calling what we want to predict. So in the case that the response is quantitative, uh, then it is a, we label that as a regression problem. But if the response is categorical, then we delete, sorry, we label that a classification problem. Uh, however, it is mentioned also that really it doesn't matter what, what type of variable is the is what you want to predict. Like is it a number or is it a category? Because you can do some transformation of your data. In this case, some transformation of what you want to predict so that you can apply pretty much all of the techniques that we are going to be covering in this book. So, and now we dealt with uh, estimating F. Uh, we mentioned a little bit how to do it, but now we want to compare such estimations. Like, is there really a best estimation for each problem? Uh, of course, there isn't. If there were, there probably, and data science wouldn't, wouldn't really exist. So yeah, so there is no best method for statistical learning. And the efficacy of this method, its accuracy really, it will depend on the data set even. So I don't know, that, that's kind of sad. Or perhaps it, it's kind of happy because now data science is a joke. So for a specific data set, and between all of these possible estimates of F, then how do we compare them? Which is the, perhaps not the best, but which is better than the other? So now we discuss that in, in this part, and it's called measuring the quality of fit. So how accurate our our predictions. Um, and yeah, and let me clarify that uh, until, no, sorry, from now on, uh, we will be focusing on the regression problems. So. 
what we want to predict is, a, is an actual number, no, not a category, a category. And this we will see uh, later on. So I, I will mention when the predicted value is a category. So where I want, sorry, where was I? Over here. And uh, how do we uh, measure if a model is accurate or not? Uh, as mentioned in the beginning of the chapter, a uh, common way to do that is via the mean squared error. You simply average this quantity uh, over this sum, and that would be the, the real value, that is the actual observed value, and what is the predicted value that your model has uh, I know, generated. So this MSC, mean squared error, uh, we can interpret it so that if this value, this MSC is very small, then it means that the predicted and the two responses, uh, they are very similar. The, the model is probably good. So we really want the model to accurately, to accurately predict and send data. That is not the data that we are using, that we are using it, sorry, that we are using to train. Sorry, so not the training data. Uh, because that's what, uh, that is what accounts for the generalization that we are doing. Uh, and in that sense, really the best model will be such one that produces the lowest test MSE, not the lowest training MSE. So the, the lowest, sorry, the test MSE really is the same formula, but over here, uh, what it is changing simply which uh, which data are you using in your model? You, you are no longer using the data to train it. No, you are using new one, which we call the testing data. Uh, uh, and obviously for such data, the testing data, you do know its, its true responses, if uh, it's true values for Y. Uh, however, it's not true that the model with lowest training MSC will also have the lowest MSC. And uh, let's see, it says to go to this page. Um, yeah, so I will explain this, this image. So in this case, uh, we're considering F, that is uh, the, true, the true or theoretical relationship via this black line over here in the graph in the left. And then we are considering as well um, three estimates of such function f. So that is three models. Over here in, in yellow, it's simply a, a typical regression line. Uh, this part in, in green, it's a more flexible approach. So there is like more wiggling around in, in that curve. Uh, but now for the other model, this one is in bluish. I, I forgot how to say light blue in, in, in English. In Spanish, it's celeste. Uh, uh, so I, I will simply call it blue. So for this for this blue curve, there is another flexible, not as much as the green one. And at least from a simple visual inspection, uh, this blue graph does seem to be estimating better this and this uh, this graph sorry this curve in in black that is the actual f function and now what where we are what we are considering over here in the graph is in the x-axis we are going to be considering uh, like well he says it's flexibility but he mentions that he's really talking about degrees of freedom so the, the bigger the, the number, we are talking more, sorry, more bigger and bigger degrees of freedom for our estimations. Uh, and, that's, and that translates to, to more, to wigglier and wigglier functions. So for example, this green one, it's much wiggler than the blue one. Uh, in the, if we were talking about polynomial, polynomials, it would really just be like a polynomial of greater uh, highest of greater highest exponent. 
uh, and now that, that is on the x-axis over here in this graph in the right. And in the y-axis, we are measuring the mean squared error. That is an MSA, MSC term that we discussed before. And now we are considering two graphs. Over here in, I, I know, I think it's gray. In gray, and we are working with the training MSC. So they have this, these estimations and they simply compare uh, via the inputs. What is the differences? Sorry, what is the average? No, what is the mean the squared error that these estimates uh, are generating for these inputs? And they are simply graphing it over here as they consider more and more degrees of freedom. So there is more wigglier curves on the left. And as we can see, it's really going down. And, and it makes sense because as you allow for more flexibility so that it, so that even to the point that your curve can pass along every point in the in the input, so every point over here in the left, and then the predicted values that you that you would get, uh, you can make it, you can make them re pretty close to the actual values in, in the graph. So really, you can make the difference and uh, go to zero. And or perhaps not, if you are feed the data too much, as happened with the green curve. Uh, but now with the, with the red curve, and now in this graph in the right, uh, they are considering the test MSC. So, and because this is a, a constructed scenario where like we are assuming that we have full control of F, that is the curve in black. And we have also some testing data set, and that is its X values. It's a Y value that we wanted to predict. And now we're going to use that uh, new data to compare it with the estimates that we have over here in the left. For example, for our linear regression case, that is this yellow, yellow graph. If we focus now on the right graph, and uh, then the training MSC is lower than the testing MSC. Uh, now, uh, and they are quite above this dashed line, this horizontal dashed line. Uh, I think it has not been discussed yet, but that is like a minimum for the testing MSC. So now for the second case, there is this, this graph in, in blue. If we compare the training MSC, at least over here, with the testing MSC, then they are they are not only kind of close, but they are actually really, really close to the actual minimum that the test MSC can have. But now as we consider having even more and more flexible estimates, then the training goes almost to zero. We have too much freedom to fit a curve along the data. But if we consider now the testing MSC, then Instead of going down such values, as we saw from two flexibility to five, and it actually went up. So uh, our model, it's, it hasn't really worked uh, quite well as a generalization for how to predict the Y values. It really worked mostly for the, sorry, this green model, this green line, uh, this green curve, it didn't really work uh, for this testing data set. Mostly for the training data set it worked. So like a, a good balance, uh, perhaps a way to consider which would, which would be the, the better model, sorry, the, the best model, at least in this one that, that we have considered is, uh, well, this case where the testing MSC went to a minimum, that is, it got at least very, very close to this value uh, represented by the dashed line. Uh, this minimum will be discussed in a later, sorry, in a couple of minutes. Yes. So that would be the, the, the better model. And of course, uh, we can see it visually, but uh, at least from what I got from, from this chapter, is that uh, we really need like a, a good grasp of measure theory, or at least probability theory uh, and functional analysis because they are considering. For example, in this in left graph, 
they are almost considering which function is closest to another one. So in, in that way, you are really like, trying to establish a, a metric, like a way to compare distances between them. Uh, and, and I mean, that, that's the, that's the, the common case that you do in functional analysis, right? Like, uh, vector spaces of functions uh, where you also have a norm. So you also have a way to, to correctly talk and discuss uh, between, sorry, and discuss distances between functions. So, sorry, where was it? Over here. So really what I explained over here, it's summarized in this part. Uh, and there is this fundamental property that for any data set and any statistical learning method that you apply for such a data set, uh, then as a flexibility of the statistical learning method increases. So as we saw over here, when we go to the right, uh, then the training MSD decreases monoto monotonically. So we can see over here. And also the test MSC graph has a U shape. So like it, it achieves a minimum in this case is this, and then it starts, it starts going up. Um, so a quote from the book, it says, as model flexibility increases, training MSC will decrease, but the test MSC may not. And also, a small training MSC, but a big test MSC in place having overfitted the data, as we saw here, in this green, green case, this green curve, that it followed along too much these uh, scattered points that it, deviate, it deviated from the actual function that we wanted to describe. That is this graph, sorry, this black function, no, this black curve. And it says estimating the test MSC is very difficult. Uh, so that is estimating you know, how well your model generalizes for other data, not just a training one. And that is because usually, and that happens usually because of lack of data, but later in the book, we will discuss uh, uh, ways to mitigate that problem. There is ways to approximate this minimum of this testing MSC graph. And an example is cross-validation, but we, we'll see it later on. So, so as we saw over here in this right graph, there is a kind of balance that is when points, sorry, when these curves are getting really, really close to this dashed line, and that is really, really close to the minimum of the testing MSE. And, and this happens because of this, this concept, the bias variance trade-off. So let me first um, put the definitions and then take into account the, the question that, uh, that Jeffrey asked us. So, for example, what is the expected test MSC at some point x sub zero? Uh, well, we will label that as this value. Uh, it, it says it refers to the average test MSC that we would obtain after repeatedly estimating f using a long using a large number of training sets and test and tested each estimate at x0. So it's an average along a set of possible training sets. So yeah, I mean, it's quite, I, maybe not obvious, but it seems quite clear that a tool for this uh, are probably functional analysis. I haven't still checked here, uh, read the proofs for this in the in the more formal book related to this, but uh, maybe later on, maybe later on I can I can add, add in a couple of notes uh, related to that. Now another definition: the variance of a statistical learning model, uh, which produces an estimate f hat refers to how the estimate function, that is this f hat, changes uh, when you provided, uh, when you have provided it with different training data sets. So for example, uh, we fixate uh, on using a, a, only a, a line 
as our model, but now perhaps we are dealing with different training data set, data set. So in this case, it would be different sets of scattered points. Uh, and then we would have to, to find a way to estimate how this estimate in this case, it would be how this yellow line is changing as we change the training data set. So it's like measuring a change in these estimate functions. In this case, it would be a change in, in, this, in these lines, in these linear regression functions. Uh, and another definition is the bias of our statistical learning method. Uh, and that, is, that refers to the error generated by approximating a possibly complicated model like happens usually in real life be a, a much simpler one. And uh, at least in the way that I interpreted that is like how the actual F is differing for that. Uh, it's referring to the possible estimates that you are giving. For example, over here, how this black line is differing from the yellow line, how, how different it is from this green line or from the blue one. So now it's like a, a distance between, between F has, between estimates. Um, as a general rule, the more flexible the statistical method, the higher, well, the more flexible the statistical method, there is uh, how much it accounts for the complexity of F, then the higher its variance uh, and the lower its bias. It, in a way, it makes sense that it's the, that the bias is lower because because it's more flexible, we are accounting for more uh, possible complexity of F. So really this error can get pretty small. Uh, but yeah, the variance is going to get high because, because we are considering more flexible models. They depend on more and more parameters. What we saw as, well, for example, right? As we saw as, uh, where is it? Well, what I mentioned, uh, the, or here, this beta, beta sub something coefficients. Uh, well, and because you are considering more and more parameters, and then yeah, the functions are changing quite a bit. So like a line, it's very different from a, pol from a, a parabola and a cubic polynomial, it's even more different, uh, well, between codes from a linear function. So in that sense, and then, where was it? Okay, uh, this is what I was mentioning uh, when Jeffrey asked this question, for example, and they mentioned that this can be proved. Uh, you, you fix some value x of zero, and uh, that is you fix some, some set of predictors. Uh, so you see, you fix some value of the predictors, and then it happens that uh, this expected test MSC, then it's equal to the variance of your model evaluated at, at such uh, information of the inputs plus the bias of your model, well, the bias squared of the, sorry, of the estimate also applied at, at such uh, information about the inputs and then plus the variance of the epsilon term. So, okay, so now I think we are ready to answer the question. It says, the reducible, the reducible error map onto the concept of bias. Uh, well, let's see, reducible error would be uh, F minus F prediction. It would be, it was, I was in the chat, look at it over here. Like the differences between the actual value and its estimate. Um, and now about the bias. And uh, well, over here, they aren't really considering F, like the actual relationship. But perhaps if we go to the definition, Bias, like in, in an informal way, is how F and the possible Fs are 
different from each other. Uh, and yes, we, we are measuring the difference, right? F and the estimate. We are also measuring that uh, in the definition of the of the controlled error that we have the, re the, re the reducible error. So actually, yes. Uh, I think, uh, what was the question? Does it map onto? Uh, yes, but perhaps in a more complex scenario because at least really this reducible error, what really meant, what we really meant was this over here, like simply the differences between, sorry, the difference between F and its estimate, but like simply the, like the arithmetic difference. However, when we are talking about the bias, and I am not uh, quite sure about this because I haven't really looked at the, the, the complex mathematics of this part, but they are probably, because they are talking about how F and F hat differ, but like as functions, then probably they are not considering the, the, simple, the simple metric. I, I, don't even, I don't know if it's in a metric even, probably not, uh, of simply comparing them point by point. That is what we are doing over here. Uh, what we did over here in this comparison. So it, they're probably being uh, compared to be a, a different metric. So now I think that most probably not, because if that were the case, uh, I suspect that we would have discussed a little bit more clearly uh, in the book, uh, what we actually mean by, by, by bias, not, not only this like uh, more, theoretical understanding of how f, the f function and the estimate function are different from each other. I'd have to check on that. And now let's see, it says, ah, then we notice from, from this function, right? That if we want the expected test MSC, yeah, to be as small as possible. And then we simply note that this variance is non-negative. Um, and here we are taking the square of something. So it's also non-negative. So really the minimum will happen. Uh, wait. I guess because they are both non-negative, uh, if we want to minimize this sum, and again, we don't have control over bar, the variance of epsilon, then we want to minimize each of these uh, each of these numbers, there is this actual variance and this actual bias. If one of them was negative, really, uh, then the, the approach is different, but they are non-negative. So yeah, you can simply minimize them individually. So what we want for a, let's say perfect model or the best model is to have low variance and low bias. And basically what they show in this page, is really uh, how this expected test MNC is getting decomposed into three, into these three like independent, uh, I mean, they are just, they, they, are not, they are not simply numbers, but like these independent, uh, let's say quantities. For example, over here, it's a, uh, the squared bias, that is, this thing, it's uh, the curve in blue, the, the variance of our model is uh, well evaluated at some point, is this orange curve. Uh, and as we saw this, and uh, this uh, expected test MSC was the, sorry, the test MSC was simply the sum of those quantities plus the variance of the epsilon variable. Uh, and now also it makes sense uh, when we kind of had a minimum over here because, I mean, this is not negative, so its minimum is zero. This is not negative, so its minimum is zero. Um, uh, well, the minimum, so then the minimum of, of, of this expected test MSC is really just 
well, at, at least or at most, well, some of them of, of this value, this bar of epsilon. Um, okay, so so this is a trade off. We own low variance and low bias for our models. Um, for example, we do have very much control of, over each of these, but only individually. No, sorry, only. Uh, sorry, uh, not completely over. Like, how do you explain it? It will be clear with this is next example. And we don't have complete control over them. For example, we can get extremely low bias, but high variance. And for example, if we draw a line which passes over every single point in the training data, and that is what occurred almost in this case with this red scene. It's almost passing along each one of them. We also can get extremely low, extremely low variance, but a high bias if we fit a horizontal line to the data. Now the complexity is very, very, very low. And however, the challenge lies in finding a method for which both the variance and the squared bias are very, very low. Uh, now, this I already mentioned, like we can't really compute this number in real life but there are ways to approximate it. Uh, I don't know, I think like it's 4 p.m. and I wanted to edit this part, the classification part, but it's over here. Uh, all of this. And do we cover it now or in the next meeting? Okay, yeah, I think maybe perhaps in the next meeting it would be best. Uh, now, is, it, is there anyone who, who wants to volunteer for the next presentation? Hi, Lucio, it's Derek here. I signed up for the next meeting. Oh, okay, uh, is it okay if you also do this part, the like, uh, classification setting uh, and well then the exercises or? Uh, yes, and um, are we skipping the lab? Uh, no, yes, uh, I mentioned in the first meeting that the labs, at least the previous cohorts, they, they never did the labs, only the exercises Okay. the theory. Okay, I uh, will send you uh, for presenting next week. Uh, and that, that's really it. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, I'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye.